Crime and Punishment Part 1, Subsection 6 Later, Raskolnikov somehow happened to find out precisely why the tradesman and the woman had invited, had invited Lizaveta to come back. It was a most ordinary matter, and there was nothing very special about it. A family that had moved to the city and fallen into poverty was selling things off, dresses and so on, all women's things. Since it was not profitable to sell them in the market, they were looking for a middleman, and that was what Lizaveta did. She took a commission, handled the deals, and had a large clientele, because she was very honest and always named a final price. Whatever she, whatever she said, <coughs> whatever she said, that the price would be. Generally, she spoke little and, as has, as has been mentioned, was humble and timid. But Raskolnikov had lately become superstitious. Traces of superstition remained in him for a long time afterwards, almost in indelibly. And later on, he was always inclined to see a certain, certain strangeness, a mysteriousness, as it were, in this whole affair. The presence of the present, the presence, as of some peculiar influences and coincidences. The previous winter, a student acquaintance of his, Pokorev, before leaving of, before leaving for Kharkov, had told him once in conversation that address of the old woman, Aliona Ivanovna, in case he might want to pawn something. For a long time he did not go to her because he was giving lessons and getting by somehow. About a month and a half ago, he had remembered the address. He had two things suitable for pawning, his father's old silver watch and a small gold ring with three little red stones of some kind, given him as a, as a keepsake by his sister when they parted. He decided to pawn the ring. Having located the old woman, who, from the very first glance, before he knew anything particular about her, filled him with insurmountable lo loathing. He took two little bills from her, and on his way back stopped at some wretched tavern. He asked for tea, sat down, and fell into deep thought. thought. A strange idea was hatching in his head, like a chicken from an egg, and occupied him very, very much. Almost next to him, at another table, sat a student he did not know or remember at all, and a young officer. They had been playing billiards and were now drinking tea. Suddenly he heard the student talking with the officer about a money lender, Aliona Ivanovna, widow of a collegiate secretary, and telling him her address. That in itself seemed somehow strange to Raskolnikov. He had just left her, and here they were talking about her. By chance, of course, but just then, when he could not rid himself of a certain quite extraordinary impression, it was as if something had come, had come to his service. The student suddenly began telling his friend various details about this Aliona Ivanovna. She's nice, he was saying. You can always get money from her. She's rich as a Jew. She can hand you over, over 5,000 at once, but she's not above taking pledges for a ruble. A lot of us have gone to her already. Only she's terribly harp. She's, she's a terrible harpy. And he began telling how wicked she was, how capricious, how if your payment was one day late, your pe your pledge was lost. She gives four times less than the thing is worth and takes five or even seven percent a month, and so on. The student went on chattering and said, among other, th other things, that the old woman had a sister, Lizaveta, and that the disgusting little hag used to beat her all the time and kept her completely enslaved, like a little child. child. Though Lizaveta was at least six feet tall. She's quite a phenomenon herself, the student cried out and guffered. Guffawed. G-U-F-F-A-W-E-D. I don't know how to say that. They began talking about Lizaveta. The student spoke of her with some special pleasure and kept laughing. And the officer, who listened with great interest, asked the student to send this Lizaveta to him to mend his linen. Skolnikov did not miss a word and at once learned everything. Lizaveta was the old woman's younger half-sister, they had different mothers, and was, and was 35 years old. She worked day and night for her sister, was cook and laundress in the house, and besides, this, and besides that, sued things for sale, and even hired herself out to wash floors, and gave everything to her sister. She did not dare take any orders or any work without the old woman's permission. Meanwhile, the woman had already been had already made her will, a fact known to Lizaveta, who, apart from movable poverty, property, chairs, and so forth, did not stand to get any penny from this will. Oh, that sucks. All the money was to go to a monastery in N province for the eternal remembrance of her soul. 
Wow. Wow. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa Vetta was a tradeswoman, not of official rank. She was unmarried and of terribly awkward build, remarkably tall, with long, somehow twisted legs, always wore down, wore down at heel goatskin shoes, but kept herself neat. Above all, the student was surprised, and laughed at the fact that Lisa Vetta was constantly pregnant. What? Wow. But you say she's ugly, the officer remarked. Well, yes, she's dark skin, looks like a soldier in disguise, but, you know, she's not ugly at all. She has such a kind face and eyes. Very much so. A lot of men like her. There's the proof. She's so quiet, meek, uncomplaining, agreeable. She agrees to everything, and she does have a very nice smile. Ah, so you like her too, the officer laughed. For the strangers of it. For the strangeness of it. No, but I'll tell you one thing. I could kill and rob the cursed old woman, and that, I assure you, without any remorse, the student added hotly. The officer guffed again, and Raskolnikov gave a start. How strange it was! Excuse me, I want to ask you a serious question, the student began ardently. I was just joke I was joking just now, but look. On the one hand, you have a stupid, meaningless, worthless, wicked, sick old crone, no good to anyone, and on the contrary, harmful to everyone, who doesn't know herself why she's alive, and who will die on her own tomorrow. Understand? Understand? So, I understand, the officer replied, looking fixedly at his ardent friend. Listen, now, on the other hand, you have, a f you have fresh young forces that are being wasted for lack of support, and that by the thousands, and that everywhere. A hundred, a thousand good deeds and undertakings that could be arranged and set out by the money that old woman had doomed to the monastery. Hundreds, maybe thousands of lives put right, dozens of families saved from destitution, from decay, from ruin, from depravity, from the venerable hospitals, all of her money. Kill her and take her money, so that afterwards, its help, afterwards, with its help, you can devote yourself to the service of all mankind and the common cause. What do you think? Wouldn't thousands of good deeds make up for one tiny little crime? For one, for one life, thousands of lives saved with from decay and corruption. One death for hundreds of lives. It's, a, it's simple arithmetic. And what does the life of this stupid, consumptive, and wicked old crone mean in the general balance? No more than the life of a louse, a cockroach, no, and not even that much, because the old crone is harmful. She's eating up someone else's life. The other day, she got so angry that she bit Lidza Vecha's finger. Whoa. <laughs> they almost had to cut it off. Of course, she doesn't deserve to be alive. The officer remarked, but that's nature. Eh, brother, but the nature had to be. But nature has to be corrected and guided. Otherwise, we'd all drown in prejudices. Without that, there wouldn't be, be even a single great man. Duty, conscience, conscience, they say. I'm not going to speak. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to speak against duty and conscience. But how do we really understand them? Wait, I'll ask you one more question. Listen. No, you wait. I'll ask you a question. Listen. Well, you're talking and making speeches now, but tell me, would you yourself kill the woman, old, the old woman or not? Of course not. It's for the sake of justice that I... I'm not the point here. Well, in my opinion, if you yourself don't dare, then there's no justice in it at all. Let's shoot another round. Raskolnikov was greatly agitated. Of course, it was all the most common and ordinary youthful talk and thinking. He had heard it many times before, only in different forms and on different subjects. But why precisely now did he have to hear precisely such talk and thinking, when exactly the same thoughts had just been conceived in his own head? And why precisely now, as he was coming from the old woman's bearing, the germ of his thought, should he chance upon a conversation about the same old woman? This coincidence... See, always seemed strange to him. This negligible tavern conversation had an extreme influence on him in the further development of the affair, as though there were indeed some predestination, some indication in it. Having, ret having returned from the haymarket, he threw himself on the sofa and sat there for a whole hour without moving. Meanwhile, it grew dark. He had no candle, and besides, and besides it did not occur to him to make a light. <coughs> He was never able to recall whether he thought about anything during that time. In the end, he became aware that he was still feverish, chilled, and realized with delight that it was also possible to lie down on the sofa. Soon, a deep, leaden 
Leiden, L-E-A-D-E-N, sleep, like a heavy weight came over him. He slept suddenly. He slept unusually long and without dreaming. Nastasia, who came into his room at ten o'clock in the morning, had difficulty shaking him out of it. She brought him tea and bread. It was reused again. It was reused tea again and again in her own teapot. Look at him sleeping there! She cried indignantly. All he does is sleep. He raised himself with an effort. His head ached. He got to his feet, took a turn around his closet, and dropped back on, back on the sofa. Falling asleep again, Nata- Nastasia cried. Are you sick or what? He made no reply. Want some tea? Later, he said with an effort, closing his eyes again and turning to the wall. Nastasia to- stood over him for a while. Maybe he's really sick, she said. Turned, turned, and went out. She came in again at two o'clock with soup. He lay as before. The tea remained untouched. Nastasia even got offended and began shaking him angrily. "You're still snoring away!" she cried, looking looking at him with disgust. He raised himself slightly and sat up, but said nothing and stared at the ground. "Are you sick or aren't you?" Nastasia asked, and again got no reply. "You'd better go out at least," she said after a pause. "You'd at least have some wind blowing on you. Are you going to eat or what?" Later, he uttered faintly, "Go," and he waved his hand. She stood there. There a while longer, looking at looking at him with compassion, and went out. After a few minutes, he raised his eyes and stared for a long time at the sea, at the tea and soup. Then he took the bread, took the spoon, and began to eat. He ate a little, three or four spoonfuls, without appetite, as if mechanically. His head ached less. Having finished his dinner, he stretched out on the sofa again, sofa again, but could not sleep now. He lay motionless on his stomach, his face buried in the pillow. He kept daydreaming, and his dreams were all quite strange. Most often, he imagined he was somewhere in Africa, in Egypt, in some oasis. The caravan is resting. The camels are peacefully lying down. Palm trees stand in a full round circle, full circle round, circle around. Everyone is having dinner, and he keeps drinking water right from the stream, which is there just beside him, flowing and bubbling. And the air is so fresh and wonderful. Wonderful water is so blue, cold, running over the many-colored stones and over such clean and sparkling. And over such clean sand, sparkling with gold, all at once he clearly heard the clock strike. He gave a start, came to, raised his head, looked out, looked at the window, realized what time it was, and suddenly jumped up, pulling himself together as if someone had torn him from the sofa. He tiptoed to the door, to the door, quietly opened it a little, and began listening downstairs. His heart was pounding terribly. It was all quiet downstairs, as if, as if someone. As if everyone were asleep, it seemed wild and strange to him that he could have slept so obliviously since the day before, and still have done nothing, prepared nothing, and meanwhile it might just have struck six o'clock. In place of sleep and torpor, an extraordinary, feverish, and somehow confused bustle came over him. The preparations instantly were not many. He strained all his energies to figure everything out and not forget. Get anything, and his heart kept be- kept beating, pounding, so that it was even hard for him to breathe. First, he had to st- first he had to make a loop and sew it into his coat, a moment's work. He felt beneath his pillow and found one of his old shirts among the linen stuffed under it, old, unwashed, completely fallen to pieces. From its tatters, he tore a strip about two inches wide and fifteen inches long. He folded the strip in two, took off his dirty, loose-fitting summer coat made from. Some heavy cotton material, the only outer garment he owned, and began sewing the end, the two ends inside it, under the left armhole. His hands trembled as he, as he sewed, but he managed it, so that nothing could be seen when he put the coat on again. The needle and thread had been made ready lo- long ago and lay in the table drawer, wrapped in a piece of paper. As for the loop itself, this was, w- this was a very clear invention of its own. Of its own, the loop was to hold the axe. Hold the axe. He could not go through the streets carrying an axe in his hands, and if he were to hide it and un- hide it under his coat, he would still have to be to keep it in place with his hand, which would be noticeable. But now, with the loop, he had only to slip the axe head into it, and the axe would hang quietly under his arm all the way. And with his hand in the side pocket of his coat, he could also hold the end of the axe handle to keep it from swinging. And since the coat was very loose, a real bag, it could not be noticed from the outside that he was holding something through the pocket with his with his hand. This loop, he had also thought up two weeks ago. 
Having finished that, he thrust his fingers into the small space between his Turkish sofa and the floor, felt near the left corner, and pledged and pulled out the pledge he had prepared long before and hidden there. This pledge was, incidentally, not a pledge at all, but simply a smooth, plain little piece of wood, about the size and thickness of a silver cigarette case. He, f he had found this piece of wood by chance during a one of his walks in a courtyard, courtyard, where there was some sort of workshop in one of the wings. Later, he added to the piece of wood a thin and smooth strip of iron, probably a fragment of something which he had also found in the street at the time. At the same time, having put the two pieces together, of, it, of which the iron one was smaller than the wooden one, he tied them, he tied them tightly, crisscross, with a thread. After which he wrapped it wrapped them neatly and elegantly in clean white paper, tied round with a thin ribbon, also crosswise, and with a little knot that would be rather tricky to untie. This was to distract the old woman's attention for a while as she began fumbling with the knot, and thereby catch the right moment. And the iron strip was added for weight, so that at least for the first moment the old woman would not guess that would not guess that the article was made of wood. And this had been kept for the time being under his sofa. Sofa. He had no sooner came. He had no sooner taken out the pledge than someone shouted somewhere in the courtyard, "It's long past six! Long past! My God!" He rushed to the door, listened, snatched his hat, and started down his thirteen steps, cautiously, inaudibly, like a cat. He was now faced with the most important thing: stealing the axe from the kitchen. That deed was to be done with an axe. He had already decided long ago. He also had a whole. He also had a folding pr pruning knife, but he could not really rely on the knife, and still less on his own own strength. And therefore, finally decided on the axe. We may note, incidentally, one peculiarity, with regard to the final, to all the final, to all the final decisions he came to in this affair. They had one strange property. The more final they became, the more hideous and absurd they at once appeared in his own eyes. In spite of all his tormenting in a struggle, never for a single moment during the whole, the whole time could he believe in this in the feasibility of his designs. If he had ever once managed to managed to analyze and finally decide everything down to the last detail, and there were no, there were no longer any doubts left, at that point he would most likely have renounced it all as absurd, absurd, monstrous, and impossible. But there remained a whole abyss of doubts and unresolved and unresolved de details. As for where to get the axe, this trifle did not worry him at, in the least, because nothing could be could have been simpler. It so happened that Nastasia was constantly in and out of the house, especially during the evening. She would run to see the neighbors or to do some shopping, and would always leave the door wide open. That was the landlady's only quarrel with her. All one had to do was go quiet in the kitchen when the time came, take the axe. And an hour later, when it was all over, go and put it back. But doubts also presented themselves. Suppose he comes in an hour to put it back there. To put it back, and there is Nastasia. Of course, he would have to pass by and wait until she went out again. But what? But what if, meanwhile, she misses the axe, looks for it, starts shouting? There is suspicion for you, or at least grounds for suspicion. But these were still trifles he had not. Even begin to think about, nor did he have time. He had thought about the main thing and put the trifles off until he himself was convinced of everything. But this last, but this last seemed decidedly unrealizable. Unreli oh man, I'm really struggling today. At least it seemed to him he could in no way imagine, for example, that one day he would finish thinking, get up, and simply go there. Even in his even in his recent trial, that is, his visit with the intention of making a final survey of the place, was only a trying out, and far from the real thing. As if he had said to himself, "Why not go and try it? Enough of this dreaming." And he was immediately unable to endure it, spat and fled, furious with himself. And yet it would seem he had already concluded the whole analysis in terms of a moral resolution of the question. His causes tree was as sharp as a razor, and he no longer, and he no longer found any conscience, conscience objections. But in the final instance, he simply did not believe himself, and stubborn, stubbornly, slavish, slavishly, sought ob, sought objections on all sides, gropingly, as if, as if someone were forcing him and drawing him into it. 
This last day, which had come so much by chance and resolved everything at once, affected him almost wholly mechanically, as if someone had taken him by the hand and pulled him along irresistibly, blindly, with unnatural force, without objections, as if a piece of his, as if a piece of his clothing had been caught in the cogs of a machine he were being dragged into. At first, even long before, he had been occupied with one question, why almost all crimes are so easily detected and solved, and why almost all criminals leave such an obviously marked trail. He came gradually to various and curious conclusions, the chief reason lying, in his opinion, not so much in the material impossibility of concealing the crime as in the criminal himself. The criminal himself, almost any criminal, experiences at the moment of the crime a sort of failure of will and reason, which, on the contrary, are replaced by a phenomenal childish thoughtlessness, just at the moment when reason and prudence are most necessary. According to his conviction, it turned out that this doctrine of reason and failure of will take hold of a man like a disease, develop gradually, and reach their height shortly before the crime is committed. They continue unabated during the moment of the crime itself, and for some time after it, depending on the individual, then they pass in the same way as any disease, as any disease passes. But the question whether the disease generates the crime, or the crime somehow by its peculiar, peculiar nature is always accompanied by something akin to disease, he did not yet feel able to resolve. Having come to such conclusions, he decided that in his own personal case there would be no such morbid revolutions, that reason and will would remain within, with him in a, in a, inalienably, inalienably throughout the fulfillment of what he had plotted, for the sole reason that what he had plotted was not a crime. We omit the whole process by which, by means of which he arrived at this later, this is at this latter decision. We have to run too far ahead of ourselves as it is. We will only add that the factual, purely material difficulties of the affair generally generally played a most secondary role in his mind. Since I will have kept all my will and reason over them, they too will be defeated in due time. Once I have acquainted myself to the minutest point with all the details of the affair. But the affair would not get started. He went on believing least of all in his final decisions, and when he and when the hour was struck struck. Everything came out not the way at all, not that way at all, but somehow accidentally, even almost unexpectedly. One quite negligible circumstance already non nonplussed him even before he got down the stairs. He having reached the Having reached the landlady's kitchen, wide open as always, he cautiously took a sidelong glance to see if the landlady herself might be in, might be there in Nastasia, in Nastasia's absence, and if not, whether the, whether the door to her room was tightly shut, so that she could not somehow peek out as he went in to take the axe. How great was, how great was his amazement when he suddenly saw that Na, that Nastasia was not only at home this time in her kitchen, but was even doing something, taking laundry from a basket and hanging it on a line. Seeing him, she stopped, turned, she stopped hanging, turned towards him, and looked at him all the while he was passing by. He turned away and walked past as if noticing nothing, but the affair was finished. No axe. He was terribly struck. And where did I get that and where did I get the idea he was thinking as he went down to the gateway? Where did I get the idea that she was sure to be away right now? Why, why, why was I so certain of it? He was crushed, even somehow humiliated. He wanted to laugh at her. he wanted to laugh at himself in his anger. Dull, brutal rage was seething in him. He stopped in the gateway, reflecting. To go out to walk around the streets just for the sake of appearances was revolting to him. To return home even more revolting. To lose such an opportunity forever, he muttered, standing aimlessly in the gateway, directly opposite the caretaker's dark closet, which was also open. Open. Suddenly he gave a start. From the caretaker's closet, which was two steps away from him, from under underneath the bench to the right, the gleam of something caught his eye. He looked around. Nobody. On tiptoe, he approached the caretaker's room, went down the two steps and called the caretaker in a faint voice. Sure enough, he's not home. Must be nearby, though somewhere in the yard, since the, since the door is wide open. He rushed headlong for the axe, it was an axe, and pulled it from under, under the bench, where it lay between two logs. He slipped it into the loop at once, before going out, put both hands in his pockets, and walked out of the caretaker's room. No one noticed! If not reason, then the devil, he thought, grinning strangely.
The incident encouraged him enorm enormously. He went quietly and sedately on his way, without hurrying, so as not to arouse any suspicion. He barely looked at the passers-by, even tried not to look at their faces at all, and to be as incon inconspicuous as possible. Then he suddenly remembered his hat. My God! I had money two days ago and couldn't even change it for a cap. A curse rose up in his soul. Glancing into a shop by chance, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed that, that the clock on the wall already showed ten past seven. Ten minutes past seven. He had to hurry, and at the same time he had to make a detour to get to the house from the other side. Earlier, when he had happened to picture it all in his imagination, he sometimes thought that he would be very afraid. He was not very afraid now, not even not afraid at all. He was even occupied at the moment with certain unrelated thoughts, though not for long. Passing the Yusupov Yus garden, he, came, he even became much absorbed in the notion of setting up tall fountains and, all, and of how they would freshen the air in the public squares. Gr gradually, he arrived at the conviction that if the summer garden were expanded across the entire field of Mars and even joined in the garden of the Mikhailovsky Palace, it would be a wonderful and most useful thing for the city, at which point he suddenly became interested in precisely why people of all big cities are somehow especially inclined, not really out of necessity alone, to live and settle in precisely those parts of the city where there are neither gardens nor fountains, where there is filth and stench, and all these sorts of squalor. S-Q-U-A-L-O-R. At which point he recalled, it, he recalled his own walks through the hay market and came to himself for a moment. What nonsense, he thought. No, better not to think anything at all. It must be the same for men being led to out. It must be the same for men being led out to execution. Their thoughts, their thoughts must cling to every object they meet on the way. Flashed through his head, but only flashed like lightning. He hasn't to extinguish the thought. But he was already close. He was there, the house. He was here with the gates. Somewhere a clock suddenly struck once. What can it? Be half past seven? Impossible. It must be fast. Luckily for him, everything again went well at the gates. Moreover, as if as if by design, a huge hay wagon drove through the gates at the very moment, just ahead of him, concealing him completely, all the while he was passing under the archway. And as soon as the wagon entered the courtyard, he slipped quickly to the right. On the other side of the wagon, several voices could be heard, shouting and arguing, but no one noticed him, and he met no one coming his way. Many of the windows looking out onto the huge square yard were open at the moment, but he, not, but he did not raise his head. He had no strength. The stairway to the old woman's was close by, immediately to the right of the gate. He was already on the stairs. Having caught his breath and pressed his axe to his pounding heart, at the same time feeling for the axe and straining it, once again, he began cautiously and quietly climbing the stairs, pausing every moment to listen. But the stairway also happened to be quite empty at the time. All the doors were shut. He met, he met no one. True, one empty apartment on the second floor stood wide open. And painters were working in it, but they did not even look. He paused, thought for a moment, and went on. Of course it would be better if they weren't there at all, but there are two more flights above them. But here was the fourth floor. He, here was the door. Here was the apartment opposite, the empty one. On the third floor, by all, on the third floor, by all tokens, the apartment just under the old woman's was also empty. The calling card nailed to the door with nails was gone. They had moved out. He was gasping for breath. A thought raced momentarily through his mind. Shouldn't I go away? But he gave himself no reply and began listening at the old woman's door. Dead silence. Then he listened down the stairs again. Listened long, attentively. Then he looked. Then he took a last look around. Pulled himself together, straightened, him, straightened himself up, and once more felt the axe in its loop. Am I not pale? Too pale? He thought. Am I not too excited? She's mistrustful. Shouldn't I wait a little longer under, until my heart, until my heart, stops this? But his heart would not stop. On the contrary, as though on purpose, it pounded harder, harder, harder. He could not stand it. Slowly reached for the bell and rang. In half a minute, he rang again, louder. No answer. To go on ringing in vain, to go ringing in vain was pointless, and it did not suit him. The old woman was certainly at home, but she was alone and suspicious. He was somewhat familiar with her habits, and once again pressed his ear to the to the door. Either his senses were extremely sharp, which in fact is difficult to suppose, or it was indeed quite inaudible, 
or it was indeed quite audible, but he suddenly discerned something like the cautious sound of a hand on the door latch and something like a, the rustle of a dress against the door itself. Someone was standing silently just at the latch, hiding inside and listening, in the same way as he was outside, and also, it seemed, with an ear to the door. He purposely stirred and muttered something aloud, so as not to make it seem he was hiding. Then he rang for the third time, but quietly, seriously, and without any impatience, recalling it later vivid, vividly, distinctly, for this moment was etched in him forever. He could not understand where he go, where he got so much cunning, especially since his reason seemed clouded at moments, and as for his body, he almost did not feel it on him. A second later came the sound of the latch being lifted, 